Welcome, everybody. This is the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. Every week, we bring you the stories of people who are making a difference in the lives of others locally, globally, and digitally. Our goal is to inspire the folks who go to the trouble of watching the recordings that we make with all of these fascinating people that we can connect with around the world because of the flexibility of our model as a Rotary Club. We are both online and asynchronous. And if you're really curious about that, then just contact us. You can find us on the web at rotary.cool, really. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker this week. Our speaker is Arye Elfenbein. He is, he is a cardiologist and he is an entrepreneur. And he is going to talk to us about cultured seafood and his company, Wild Type. And Arye, we are so happy to have you here. Honored, and I hand the mic over to you. Welcome to the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley. Thank you so much. It's uh, it's such an honor to be here. I've really been looking forward to this, and um, just gonna share a few uh, images here to kind of um, help describe uh, what what this whole field is about, what this this whole idea is is about. Um, and so this is what we're gonna be talking about today, which is. Uh, it's salmon. Um, it's something that, uh, you know, coming from a um, life of <laughs> um, medicine originally, uh, as well as molecular biology, I never would have thought this is um, kind of where things would have landed. But it's it's been a fascinating journey. And it really, I think, started from um, a question uh, that as the, you know, we sort of see a lot of the, the change that's happening um, in climate, um, a lot of the deleterious consequences of um, what some of our um, practices have been as humans um, in building different food systems. Um, the question has been one of, you know, do we need animals to eat meat and seafood? And in particular, I think there's one that um, resonated particularly strongly um, for me, which is, do we need a new source of seafood? And so even if we don't know these numbers, um, you know, intimately, I think nobody is going to be surprised um, to learn about what overfishing looks like uh, in terms of uh, the numbers of fish that are now more endangered, um, even critically endangered, um, what overfishing has done to, to our um, fish stocks around the world. Um, but I think what, what has been surprising in the last couple of years is understanding a lot of what the consequences have been um, as externalities of um, our current seafood system. And by that, I mean, there was this fascinating and devastating study that, that came out. It was published in, in Nature a couple of years ago um, that basically showed that one mode of uh, seafood production, which is deep sea trawling, essentially uh, dragging these city-sized nets across the bottom of the ocean, um, releases as much carbon into the atmosphere as all of the airplanes combined. I think until then, people didn't really um, appreciate that, that fishing on its own um, and sort of, you know, emitted so, so much carbon. And this is, you know, just one example of kind of what's what's happening in the world. Um, we're also finding that the, the sites for traditional fish farming or um, aquaculture are becoming more limited um, for a couple of reasons. The, the first is that as waters warm, um, for some of these cold water fish, we either have to go further north in the northern hemisphere or further south in the southern hemisphere. Um, there are limitations around you know, where, where this can happen. And we've also found that the, the issues of unsustainability are ones that present as um, ecologic dead zones after some time where these fish are, um, are sort of farmed in, in a concentrated fashion. Uh, and then there are just um, some you know, disasters that occur. For example, um, there has been farming of Atlantic salmon in the Pacific Ocean for quite a while, and there have been the the breaks of pens, and so um, these Atlantic salmon are now invasive species in the Pacific Ocean, um, and so this has led to legislation um, that has uh, effectively banned um, the farming of Atlantic salmon in Washington State, and other places are are following suit. These are these are all sort of pointing to you know a, a similar. Um, uh, d description of it just becoming more difficult um, to to have access to not only just quality seafood, um, but also affordable uh, seafood. And so in the US, somewhere between 70 to 80% of seafood is, is imported. And for, for um, that reason, we, we often see a lot of the market forces at play um, in ways that, that don't present as much for um, 
uh, for uh, beef and poultry, for example. And so if you adjust to inflation, and this isn't even the more, most recent sort of uh, inflation adjustment, you can just see um, how, how seafood has um, just increased in, in cost um, and has become increasingly inaccessible. And so this, this is really our reason for existence as, as a company. And I'd say that we certainly um, weren't the first ones to think of this, this idea. Um, the first demonstration uh, demonstration of this actually um, happened about 20 years ago in France, and this is Oren Katz, who is uh, an amazing artist and scientist, and created um, this uh, experience um, to to effect effectively take a, a small part of a, a frog's leg and grow it outside of the frog and serve it to guests um, while the frog was actually watching. Um, the frog was later released into a, a garden nearby and. Um, the, the idea of this demonstration is, is really what I was describing earlier, is that you know, perhaps we don't need animals to eat meat. And I don't mean a sort of plant-based uh, uh, version of that. I mean actual animal cells and, and animal tissue. Um, and even you know, in the 1930s, Winston Churchill had uh, described uh, the absurdity of growing an entire chicken just to, just to eat part of it. Um, and in terms of you know how this works, essentially there there are two parts. The first is growing the cells of the animal, um, and this really does look like um, a brewery type system. And if you're able to ever visit us in San Francisco, I'll show you um, exactly what that is in in some later slides. But uh, but that's kind of the the first step. And then these cells on their own don't really know how to organize into um, the you know the, all of the complexities of sashimi, for example. And so we have to provide them with a scaffold, which is essentially plant based ingredients that they can sort of grow within as they would within the the, um, the animal within the fish over time you know this is something that um, we can change in terms of these complexities so that scaffold up front if you think about the 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 furthest uh, left side there is kind of what a plant-based um, product would be. And on the, the all the way to, to the right is something that probably exists in the future. This is something that where the cells are really able to to grow maybe even over the course of months to, to, um, to essentially replicate all of the complexities that they would within the animal. And so our, our industry is, is somewhere um, on that spectrum in terms of what the cells contribute and what the, the scaffold uh, contributes to the overall texture, flavor, all of the, the culinary properties that um, you know, are, are an important part of the seafoods we eat. So this is really where it all began. And for us, everything that we've created has actually come from one little fish. Um, I, I took this photo because I think um, baby salmon that, that we um, got to know were actually um, just the most incredible animals. Um, and the, the, the cells that we were able to isolate from, from this first salmon um, have meant that we haven't needed to go back to the animal since then um, for um, about four, over four years now. It, it's a it's a fascinating life cycle for for salmon, as um, many of us know. Um, they spend part of their time in freshwater, part in saltwater. They will travel enormous distances, find their way back uh, to their um, to the streams in which they were born, where they spend their their final days. And this kind of complexity is one that. Uh, you know, it's 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 a preposterous uh, assumption to think that we would be able to recreate all of that um, just you know within a couple of years. And so this is something we're we're constantly learning and sort of um, improving as we understand more about the underlying biology of these these fascinating animals. And so the ways that we're able to to kind of um, change the different aspects of the product are through these cell lines. Um, some will um, grow differently, some will sort of, you know, taste different. Um, the scaffolds, <clears throat> how they grow again, and how the cells and scaffolds integrate together. This is an example of, of cells um, grown on different scaffolds, the same cells, and basically they will adapt to their environment. You can see how different the, the structure is depending on, on the scaffold that they, they grow on. And so when we think about scaffolds, and this is an electron mi micrograph of um, what some, some of the scaffolds we've worked with look like, we want things that are you know, food grade, cheap, like all of the things that you could imagine um, would need to, to go into um, a, a food product, um, clean being an important one. And um, finally, one that cells like to, to grow within. And so here are some examples of what these, these um, 
uh, uh, microscopy images, the green here are, are the cells. And you can see over time, over a month, um, these cells really start to form the, the same kind of structures that they uh, would within, within a fish. And so there are differences between the scaffolds. You can see some form as a sheet on the top and some sort of go deeper. And, and this is how we, uh, we work to uh, essentially create the right environments for the cells um, to, to grow within. I'll maybe skip through what some of the other testing we've looked like, uh, we've, we've worked through is, but um, I'll just say that even for, particularly for salmon, I think it's an exceptional challenge because um, we do eat with our eyes first. And so looking at what makes a salmon orange or that sort of you know pinkish hue, um, it's these fascinating uh, molecules. There are these um, that are essentially beta carotene derivatives. Uh, there are these um, uh, sort of uh, structural aspects uh, in terms of how uh, we have these white bands and striations and, and the sort of, you know, orange parts as well. And this is all what we needed to understand in the early days in order to, to recreate it. We're sort of seeing in the future um, that right now, um, people have felt like we've maybe hit a bit of a ceiling when it comes to, to plant-based alternatives. I think that this year we've seen the first couple of approvals of FDA for these cultivated products. Um, hopefully ours um, will be uh, um, uh, among those uh, for, for this year. And I think that it's a, it's a really special time to really think about how we can um, build a food system based on um, the values of the 21st century. These are some examples of, of our tanks and our facility, and I, I do hope you are all able to come visit at some point. Um, and what I was going to say that is that this is you know, still a very sort of old fashioned way to, to do this. Um, when we think about the kinds of products and inputs we need for um, feeding these cells, there's certainly um, going to be uh, so many aspects of, of future innovation that, that will shape this. Um, it also means really describing this as food and our cultural connection to food. There was this fascinating um, book that uh, has just come out for children, actually, about where meat comes from. And um, it describes cellular agriculture, and, and it ends by saying, well, you know, this isn't how we used to uh, create meat. And, and the child asks, well, how was that? And, and uh, the adult says, well, well, we'll save that for another time. And it just, you know, sort of shows that, you know, this is kind of how we can think about um, future cultivation of food. This is also an opportunity for true transparency. And I mean that in a very literal sense. On the right is um, our facility where we have um, a tasting room. There are these glass uh, windows and you can see exactly how it's made. This certainly doesn't exist for fish farms and slaughterhouses today. And I think it's gonna be an important part of, of creating um, a, a great food system. And then this is an example of not just our food, but those of um, our colleagues in this field. And this is something that you know we need to all do this together by creating amazing, amazing food. Um, that's our crew. I hope that uh, people can come visit, come meet us, learn more about how uh, it's made. We're in San Francisco um, in the dog patch. And um, I would love to, to turn it over to any questions um, we might have. Thank you so much. Excellent, Arya. Thank you very much for your time and the opportunity to learn about the work happening at WildType. So as we always do, we invite those who are joining as a part of the recording to share questions through the chat, as, as I've described, and I'll introduce the group that we have as well. Uh, we have, in, in addition to myself, Rushton, we have four other members of our club uh, on the recording in, uh, in Texas. Rory, please wave. Uh, here in the Bay Area, Phil, uh, we have in Italy, we have Cecilia, our treasurer, and in Central America, we have Maria. Now, Arie, uh, to, to get us started on this, um, I, I, I have got like this, this rather lengthy list of questions to, that, that I'm, I'm excited to explore with you. And, and, and the first is one that you touched upon briefly, but, but it has to do with the, the rather jolting uh, news that we were getting in July about ocean temperatures in the Florida Keys reaching like hot tub levels, these kinds of things. As as we see those kinds of issues happening, does that does that have a particular effect on on how you think of your business? It can 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 your business exist anywhere just under the proper conditions, or or are there are there elements to climate change that 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 may be a factor in how you do what you do? Yeah, it's, it's a really great question. Um, you know, I'll say that 
uh, part of the versatility of um, salmon and part of their resilience as uh, an, an incredible animal um, is their ability to thrive in a lot of different conditions. And so what applies to, um, to fish doesn't apply as much to, for example, mammalian or avian species, where there is a much more narrow temperature range um, in which the, the cells will thrive. But we've actually found just how tolerant um, this process is to uh, fluctuations in, in temperature and pH and oxygen um, that, that that's around and that you know that that really does show how how unique the physiology is of, of fish. But you know more specifically, I'd say that um, because of how similar um, brewing systems are to the types of systems that um, that we create, the ability to have uh, environmental controls and um, essentially uh, grow cells in um, the ranges of room temperature, um, whatever uh, that might be, means that we're able to operate these in, in very sort of, you know, like standard um, f facilities that uh, don't require um, much more than what's what's typically needed for, um, uh, for you know, humans to, to, to live within um, in terms of uh, the temperatures that we tolerate. Uh, but certainly, you know, as, as things maybe continue to progress, um, in terms of climate change, that's that's something um, that that will have to be reconsidered as well. Got it. A uh, question that came in from uh, the chat uh, about omega three fatty acids, uh, like the, what what gets produced in cultured seafood. Is it comparable to what happens with wild seafood? Um, absolutely. It's one of the reasons that we chose uh, salmon as a first product instead of let's say ground beef or chicken. Um, as a cardiologist, obviously, this is something that I feel very attuned to. Um, we, uh, from the beginning, have had equivalent levels of omega-3s, omega-6s, other um, polyunsaturated fatty acids that, uh, you know, have a protective benefit for coronary artery disease. Um, and uh, in, in the case of, of our product, it's it's equivalent. Um, interestingly, when when I thought when I sort of had always thought about cod liver oil as a source of omega threes, um, I'd always assumed that the cod were wow these like fish are really good at making omega threes like how do they do that? But they they don't. They actually just accumulate it over time, and it's made by algae in the ocean, and then the small fish eat that, and the bigger fish eat that, and sort of accumulates in that way. And so similarly, we um, we use uh, these kind of oceanic uh, sources and algae derived sources um, of omega-3s to, to grow our cells in. There are a series of business-related questions uh, that, that I think we'll jump into. One from, from Cecilia in, in Europe. How quickly can this product be brought to Europe? The only salmon choice here is farmed Norwegian salmon. So, so tell me about uh, the expansion of a market and, and how wild type is thinking along those lines. Well, yeah, I mean, there's they, there are their market forces, and then there's um, uh, regulatory uh, aspects. And so uh, I think that Europe, um, in many ways, is um, predictably um, showing to be very, very traditional in their thinking about um, these types of products. So I um, speculate that Europe might actually be, be one of the last markets um, where this is introduced. Um, I think, you know, Singapore was first, um, the United States was uh, was second. Um, I think that there are other um, markets in, in Asia where uh, the writing is really on the wall when it comes to uh, issues of sustainability and overfishing and just the ability to um, to to continue feeding populations um, with these you know incredible seafood products in the ways that they've been able to in in prior decades, um, the so the regular regulatory forces I think are are a bit slower in Europe. There's actually I'd say um, uh, legislation now that's on the table in Italy to completely ban these types of products, um, and. Uh, I, I think that, you know, anytime something like this presents uh, such a threat, it's it's really worth sort of, you know, um, just engaging with um, conventional seafood producers, conventional uh, meat producers to, to understand what it is about this process that um, that seems uh, sort of so, so threatening and, and so scary. But I, I think Europe will be a while. Got it. So you, you mentioned Singapore as um, as the country where where things got started first. I assume you mean favorable regulatory environment when, when you say that. 
Is it also the case that in Singapore that these products are actually uh, in in the hands of consumers in in a significant way? Yeah. So you know, I think the Singaporean government. Um, by virtue of the fact that almost all of their food is imported um, and, you know, really thinks about uh, what food security looks like um, was so, and, and also being such a sort of science forward country generally, if, you know, if I were to generalize, um, these are the things that, that uh, led the regulators there to, um, to really embrace these kinds of technologies and understand them and um, and get them to, to market. Um, so it, it is available in, um, I believe, a, a couple of restaurants. I don't know how regularly or, you know, um, how, how, you know, how much uh, th there is um, that's being produced, but um, there's also an infrastructure around this that the government uh, is building now. Everything from just the, the fundamental scientific exploration of how these cells um, you know, grow together, communicate with each other, and become um, what we know of as, as these animals. To you know, a lot of the food science complexities to to make these the the cleanest and most sustainable um, seafood and meat products on the planet. The other country I should I should mention that is um, similar in terms of how um, progressive, science forward, and also concerned about food security um, is Israel, where I think some of the um, there's just su such a high density of uh, incredible innovation in this space and others, obviously. Um, but but Israel has been very much on the forefront of um, you know the the regulatory aspects and um, and will probably be one of the the first to commercialize as well. So when when we think about um, questions related to to the the development of the industry, uh, the you know, one one ramification of of the expansion of cultured seafood, of course, could well be the the diminishing of the traditional seafood industry, right? Or 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 the the fishing industry. Is it the case that there is something about how this this sector is developing that means there is an opportunity for a shift for for those companies, those those people involved in that industry? Yeah, I think, you know, for seafood, I actually don't see, I, I see the only um, diminishing aspects as being ones from uh, just the availability of, of seafood. So, you know, wild Atlantic salmon is uh, predicted to be extinct in the year 2050. Um, there's expected to be more plastic than fish in the ocean by that time as well. Um, I think that what we're seeing is so much more demand every year for seafood that I don't see the conventional um, uh, seafood industries as, as being replaced or even sort of disrupted by, by what we're creating. We are seeing um, a lot of interest from conventional fish farmers as well in this type of technology. And so I, I do see the, the, uh, the potential for um, enormous shifts. This has also happened, not just for the way that we're doing this, but for on-land facilities that are being built now and sort of um, explored as, as alternatives. Um, I think that People just see that you know we're not going to be able to keep up with um, with with the demand, and no one way to do this is going to to win. We we all need to win actually in order to have a sustainable seafood future. Maria has a question. Go ahead, Maria. Yeah, hi. Um, so I found it really interesting um, what you were saying about Europe. Um, because I mean, obviously, also Europe is big, and I used to live in Germany for twenty seven years. And to be honest, um, by traveling the world full time right now, um, I've been around and I've been in the States quite often. And to be honest, I've seen more changed in Germany um, on the side of, you know, like get in uh, alternatives of food. Um, we have a lot of vegan um, uh, restaurants. We have um, even like if you go to Aldi, um, or just like a regular normal, like even like the tiniest store, sometimes you would think um, you find, um, how do you say it, um, alternatives um, for meat, which I thought it was amazing. And going to other countries, um, also to the States, many States, I found it hard to find um, alternatives. 
it is really sad um, because I was already like so spoiled, I would say, and used to um, so many different variations of like um, the craziest and most amazing delicious cheese types um, that are vegan entirely or replacement for meat or even stuff you can like put on a on a bread or like anything like um you go in a in a german store and you have so many variation they even have like full sections just for like vegan and vegetarian stuff even also like salmon replacement they have um sushi with um salmon replacement so i don't think it's everywhere like that in europe that um people are closed up and very much like in the past um oh, oh yeah i you know yeah. what what i'd say is first of all this is this is what gives me the most hope it's that um actually the you know the behavior of of humans around this is is shifting and um and germany is uh, i i'd say an absolute shining light in in that sense because of the transition uh, that's happened where where i'm talking about what's um the difficulty is actually just in thinking about regulatory for this type of product because you know in in a sense you know if, if we were to for an, an example of salmon um, can you actually call it salmon if it didn't come from an animal? Well, on the one hand, if you're allergic to salmon, you're going to be allergic from this because it's made from salmon cells. And so we kind of have to call it salmon. On the other hand, it's um, made in such a different way that I think there's th that aspect of is, is where, you know, like I think regulators will sometimes um, need to take a bit more time. But what's what's inspiring is exactly what you're describing. It's how much is changing in terms of all of the different options that are now becoming available, how aware people are of the effect, you know, of their decisions in terms of food and, and the environment. And so I think that um, this is this is like actually going to, to make the, the biggest difference. And so we will be just, you know, sort of one more uh, option for people who want the, the sort of, you know, real uh, in, in terms of like, it actually, you know, comes from an animal that it is an animal product. Um, it doesn't have mercury, arsenic, cadmium, all of the things that are sort of, you know, parasites, antibiotics that are more and more found in our seafood system. Um, but I, I love that that this is actually, you know, happening in, in this in the more meaningful way, which is what you're describing in terms of how people think about this. Yeah, I really love that because I've been also looking for more things, um, for more change in life and um yeah, the meat industry and um, all the consuming that we do. Um, I think Germany is doing a really great job. And by traveling through um, also a little bit of lower countries, there's so much meat. Like it's hard for me to find different options because I try not to eat meat. I'm not vegetarian, I'm not vegan or anything like that. But if I can choose, I will choose not to eat meat. And, um, but I do love fish um, and I do love sushi, <laughs> but uh, I also, um, you know, look for this change and I see a lot of hope um, and thank you so much for everything that you're representing. Um, this gives me hope. No, thank you. And and it will just be from people's awareness and, and just, you know, decisions in the end. This is just, yeah, like I said, just another way to, to have our, our meats and, and have our seafoods and um, create a, a clean source of that. Ultimately, it will be up to humans, you know, uh, in terms of our own destiny. Um, and it does give me, it just really fills me with, with optimism to see um, what you're describing, um, which, is, which is amazing. Um, maybe one more question. How long does it take to um, have the growth? Um, like uh, how, how long is this process of growing yeah, you know, it typically um, it, it, it can be um, a, a wide range. You know, we have uh, looked at what happens when we have the cells grow for like six months. It's it's almost like a it becomes a bit of a wine cave at that point. It's like here's a, this one has been growing for six months. Here's one that's, you know, three months. And and there are differences. Um, but, you know, our process currently is somewhere like four to six weeks um, for, from the beginning. It's something that can be shortened. And what I'd compare it to is for fish farming. Typically, a fish will swim around for, um, for about two years before harvest. And so it's uh, much, much faster and in that sense, more efficient. Excellent. Thank you so much. A um, couple more questions, perhaps. Um, can you can you give us a bit of an overview 
uh, for, for those who might be new to even thinking about alternatives to meat, uh, to traditional, traditionally prepared and, and harvested meat, um, there's, there's plant-based alternatives to meat, there is cultured uh, meat. And, and can you talk a little bit about kind of strengths and weaknesses on, on both sides and the degree to which there is collaboration in that space or, or perhaps it is solely a competitive space? Yeah, I mean, what I'd say is it's it's not a competitive space. I think that, uh, and that's because of uh, just um, you know growing demand for meat and seafood generally. Um, and and I, the other thing I'd say is it really is more of a spectrum. There's so many different ways. Just like there's so many ways to to make your favorite dish. Um, and when it comes to food, uh, each company is bringing not just you know the sort of scientific approach, but there's a lot of artistry um, to to the different products we have. And so you know, in the strictest um, sort of one side, there are the plant based. There's also you know completely cellular, and and there are there are groups that are doing a bit of both actually, and finding that cells are able to contribute. Um, more, you know, some nutritional aspects and like textural uh, attributes and, and so forth. And, and that the plant proteins will, will actually complement that. Um, so it is, it is really a, a spectrum. I think that for each product and for each company, it's, it's its own thing. And people, um, as more of these become available and becomes more part of the public discourse, I think we'll understand better exactly what it is. Um, and this is part of the transparency. This is like actually what's really exciting um, about uh, having all of these uh, new options. So as, as a final question before we wind things down, um, we've talked about this in, in the context of, of changing demands, right? So increased demand for food, that's obviously correlated to increased population. Um, but but do you think about this in terms of, of its costs? Do you think about this as something that can address places where food shortage is is a common concern? Yeah, you know, um, it's something we've thought about from from the beginning there. It's obviously a very complex question. Um, that same artist that I described, Oren Katz, uh, you know, at one point addressed a whole group of um, people from this space and said, um, by the way, the way that you speak about uh, your products um, as an industry sometimes sounds like the way that um, factory farmers um, spoke about this in the 1940s and 50s, that we're going to put meat on every American plate um, and just make sure that there isn't too much hubris in the way that you uh, describe this. Not everybody wants to eat your products. So um, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the lesson there is that can this address um, you know, a lot of issues around accessibility, particularly for more nutritive foods? Absolutely, and that is that is the, the goal. That is what we're we're trying to do. Um, and you know, like from there, it's you know, the, all of the sort of cultural, emotional um, connections that we have to food should dictate what it is that people um, are actually interested to eat as well. Um, but absolutely, to be able to create this. Um, below price parity even for what uh, conventional seafood is and have it be completely devoid of all of the those contaminants that I described, rich in the omega-3s and, and other uh, nutritive aspects. Um, that's, that's exactly why we're doing this. Oh, wonderful. Um, I will hand it back to you for a final word uh, before we finish the recording. But for all of you who have joined us to, to listen to the stories that we bring, we thank you for taking time to, to hear uh, from the speakers that we connect with around the world. Uh, if you are a visiting Rotarian and you are looking to get a makeup uh, for your club, that does still happen in places, feel free to fill out the attendance form a little farther down the page at siliconvalleyrotary.com. Uh, and that way you can get an email generated that you can pass along to your club secretary. For everyone a little farther down the page, you'll find our forum, the Discuss, D-I-S-Q-U-S section. And we would like for you to share your thoughts. What, what brings to mind for you possibilities with regard to what you hear in this program or any other element of our meeting? Uh, as all of you may well know, our meetings are available 24-7 at rotary.cool, which will take you to siliconvalleyrotary.com. And we encourage your visits whenever you're looking to get inspired. We hope that the stories we share will be good for, for everyone uh, concerned, that, that we're bringing that that extra bit of inspiration and energy to uh, to your day. Arya, yeah, as we always like to do, we hand it back to you for the final word. What would you like for people to have in mind as they finish watching the video? 
Um, well, first, I just wanted to say again, thank you for having me. This was such a great discussion and, and really an honor for me um, to, to, to meet you and, and, and discuss all of this. And the, the final word is, is really the culmination of everything we just described, and that's that we can't do this alone. Um, by a, a um, you know, very rough estimate, we said that if, if we were to produce just 1% of all the seafood um, in the world that's, that's produced per year, um, through the approaches that I described, just 1%, we would need all of the steel tanks in the world to do that. And so what that means is there are, needs to be so many other ways of thinking about this, other approaches. Um, we just want people um, on this journey of improving our food system, making a change for good. Um, and uh, just, you know, this is the final word is, is really one about just hoping for a lot of um, collaborative approaches um, that, and, and just a, a very humble understanding that no one company, no one approach is going to um, fix all of these issues. Well, we are certainly happy to finish with a, a message of hope and collaboration. All of you, thank you very much for joining us. We will see you next week.